The second pleasure as host is to introduce today's plenary speaker, uh, someone I've known for a long time because he's at my own uh, institution. It's uh, Bob Hazen, uh, works at the Gif uh, Physical Laboratory and is also a professor at George Mason University. Uh, Bob has written uh, over a dozen uh, books in popular science. He's a huge supporter of, of the effort to communicate our science outside of uh, scientists. He got his degrees at MIT and Harvard uh, and then came to Geophysical Lab not long after that. He's the, currently the principal uh, investigator of the Deep Carbon Observatory, which is supported by the Sloan Foundation and engages an awful lot of our community in uh, investigations of the role of carbon and carbon cycling through the deep earth. Uh, and then beyond these scientific pursuits, he's an excellent trumpeter, and he's got a huge trilobite collection that's absolutely fantastic. So I hope you'll uh, help me welcome uh, Bob here for a talk today on Earth's carbon through deep time. Thank you, and it's such a pleasure to be here today to, to address you, to tell you something about the Deep Carbon Observatory first, but also to share some of my own research that relates to carbon through deep time. The Deep Carbon Observatory is an organization that was founded um, in 2009 with generous support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. We're now in the fifth year of a 10-year program, and we now have something like 1,000 collaborators from more than 40 countries around the world. So this is a big effort. We're focused on the element carbon, the fourth most abundant element in the cosmos. And indeed, carbon is disproportionately important in our lives. It's the element, of course, that's most closely associated with changes in climate and environment. It's the energy of element, of new materials, and of course, the element of life. If you take away the hydrogen and helium, I was amazed that carbon is roughly one in every four atoms in our solar system, so it is an important element. And most people talk about the carbon cycle in terms of the near-surface processes represented by typical textbook illustrations. Now, there's some hints of the deeper carbon. There's fossil fuels, there's volcanoes, but we're interested in the whole shebang. Crust to core, not only Earth, but also other planets and objects in our solar system as well. And we divide ourselves into four scientific communities interested in different aspects of this. And for each of these communities, deep means a different thing. So we have one group, the extreme physics and chemistry group, interested in the properties of carbon and extreme pressures and temperatures. And for some of those scientists, their interest starts sort of at the center of Earth and goes to higher temperatures and pressures. We have a reservoirs and fluxes community that's interested in where is the carbon? How does it move amongst reservoirs? And here there's a very large focus, for example, on plate tectonics activities, subduction, volcanism, and so forth. So here we're looking at mantle and crust. We have a group interested in deep energy that is the question of is there an abiotic source of hydrocarbons on Earth? And they focus on the lower crust, upper mantle, and processes that might occur there with fluid rock interactions. And finally, our deep life community is interested in the nature and distribution of deep microbial life. And this could be anything from a few meters down to a few kilometers. And there certainly is an amazing diversity of life that's hidden beneath our feet. Now, all of these aspects are covered in a recently published volume called Carbon and Earth. It's free. It's open access. You can go online and download any of its 20 chapters, which covers the full range of our interests. I also encourage you to go to the deepcarbon.net website, which can tell you more about becoming part of this effort. We have many, many science projects and teams that are organized and, and doing really exciting things. We have workshops all the time. So please, if you're interested in this subject, uh, get involved and talk to some of our, our leaders. We'd love to, to welcome as many people as we possibly can. So, to me, deep has a slightly different or additional meaning because I'm interested in deep time and I'm interested in Earth's carbon and how it changes through deep time. So I want to focus on three aspects of my own research that overlap with the interests of the Deep Carbon Observatory. The first has to do with the origin evolution of Earth. And I look at this from a window called carbon mineral evolution. The second aspect has to do with the origin and evolution of life. And here we're looking at carbon molecular evolution, which it turns out is intimately tied with the mineral evolution story. And finally, I'm delighted today to talk about Earth Materials data infrastructure, and I also want to pay homage to the people who won the Distinguished uh, Public Service Awards today. I think that the data resources provide an amazing opportunity for our community, which is only just being explored. And I want to show you some of the directions I'd like to see pursued in that.
Okay, so let's talk about the origin and evolution of Earth through this idea of mineral evolution. By mineral evolution, we mean a change in Earth's near-surface mineralogy through time. And there are four aspects of this that you can look at. The diversity, just the number of different mineral species, but also the distribution of those minerals, the changing composition, particularly the trace and minor element compositions that occur within those minerals, and also just the grain sizes and shapes, the morphologies of minerals, they change systematically through time, and it's something that's not received a lot of attention. When I talk about carbon mineral evolution today, I'll look at all aspects of these. Many, many collaborators in our mineral evolution work, and I, I'd love to be able to credit them all. Today, in particular, I'm going to talk about um, work that has been co collaborative with my colleague Dmitry Svrajensky from Johns Hopkins, Bob Downs and Joshua Golden from University of Arizona, and Ed Grew from the University of Maine. I really thank them for their contributions to this. The starting point of all mineralogy. What was the first mineral in the cosmos? And I'm delighted to report that it was a carbon mineral, it was diamond. It occurred in the envelopes of the very earliest energetic stars, the AGB stars, the supernovas, which were carbon rich, and it's the first place in the cosmos where you had a concentration of mineral forming elements that was dense enough, and temperatures that were low enough that you could condense through chemical vapor deposition those first nanocrystals of diamond, about 4,400 Kelvin. Cooling down to about 4,000, graphite begins to form. And so we have these first minerals, diamond and graphite, both beautiful and significant in their own right, the first two minerals in the cosmos. They're followed by about a dozen or so what we call ur minerals, including a couple other carbon-based minerals. And this is the starting point in mineralogy, all these refractory high temperature phases condensing, still preserved in pre-solar grains. And of course, carbon minerals were, if not dominant, at least they were common amongst these earliest minerals. And one of the key questions of mineral evolution is how do you go from a dozen to more than 4,800 known species today? The various processes of fluid rock interactions, of new temperature pressure environments, and biology all play a key role in that. And so we look at what the distribution of carbon minerals through time tells us about these key events, key events in geochemistry and tectonics and biology. Just to give you a background of carbon mineralogy, there are 387 approved carbon minerals. There are four carbon allotropes, they're carbides. Most of them are carbonates, both anhydrous and hydrous carbonates. And there are about 50 organic minerals, almost all of which form fairly recently in Earth history in cave deposits and also in coal. Carbon is amazing. It has oxidation states from minus four to plus four. It bonds to virtually uh, almost all the chemical elements in the periodic table are known in some set of conditions to bond to carbon. And it's in two or three or four coordination, so you have linear, planar, you have three-dimensional type structures. Now, I divide Earth history into 10 stages of mineral evolution. The first of those stages is represented by the 60 or so minerals found in chondrite meteorites. That includes the dozen Ur minerals and 48 more, no new carbon minerals here. But as soon as you start coalescing those chondrites, the achondrites represent a much wider range of mineralogy, about 250 minerals in all, including all the carbonates. So the aqueous alteration, the thermal metamorphism, the shock impacts, the differentiation of planetesimals, these gives us about 250 minerals which are known in the meteorites that fall to Earth today. Interesting point is that, that there's not a whole lot of chemical diversity. There's only about 15 or 16 different elements represented as primary elements in those minerals, and yet the complete chemical complexity of Earth's crust is represented when you hold the chondrite in your hand. Those elements have to be someplace, interstitially or perhaps in solid solution, perhaps in nanophases we haven't seen yet. But at this point, most of the chemical elements are not manifest in their own mineral species. Stage three is the normal processes of igneous evolution talked about by Norman Bowen 100 years ago. We have volcanism, we have outgassing, surface hydration. This gets us up to about 30 carbon minerals. Graphite, diamond, lonsdaleite are the carbon allotrophs. We have carbides and a bunch of, of carbonates, calcite type, dolomite type, and aragonite type carbonites appear at this stage. Stage four is the formation of granite through the partial melting of basalt or sediments. And here we more than double the number of potential minerals, primarily because of the formation of pegmatites. You know, all those beautiful minerals that form in pegmatite, boron and beryllium and uranium and cesium and so forth. All of those different minerals occur in complex pegmatites. And so we see some new carbonate minerals as well. 
However, it takes a very long time for these elements, lithium, beryllium, boron, and so forth, to be selected and concentrated. And so it turns out all known examples of complex pegmatites are younger than three billion years. It took perhaps more than a billion years before these new minerals occurred. There also are even larger scale interactions of fluid and rocks in plate tectonics especially the initiation of subduction. And that may have started three billion years ago. It may have started much earlier than that. In any case, there are new modes of volcanism. There's new kinds of massive sulfide deposits, which lead to a whole variety of interesting new carbon-bearing minerals. Um, again, all examples of these type deposits are younger than three billion years. So again, fluid rock interactions may have taken a long time to select and concentrate the elements. But here we have these new geological processes, which gets us up to about 1,500 mineral species on Earth, and about 75 of those are carbon-bearing minerals. Carbon minerals reflect the same kind of evolutionary processes that we see in the larger mineral kingdom. And now we come to life. Stage six is the origin of life, and in the earliest times, these were chemolithoautotrophs. They were microbes which essentially used the chemical potential, the redox potential of minerals and the fluids that existed on Earth already. In this particular case, then, the microbes didn't precipitate any new mineral species, but they did cause more rapid precipitation of some species, for example, the banded iron formations and carbonate minerals. So this was one of the early periods where lots of carbonates were being deposited in reef-like structures. But the game changer was oxygenation. Photosynthesis, producing oxygen, changed Earth's near surface environment irreversibly, and it led to a tripling of the number of mineral species from what we estimate roughly 1,500 to more than 4,500 species. And it simply is a matter of a changing redox conditions at Earth's surface. Now, I'm going to talk more about this at a talk later this afternoon in another session, so if you want details, but here's just the bottom line, first order estimate is that there was a lot of ferrous iron in the oceans, there was ferrous iron in the rocks, there was ferrous iron in the soils at Earth's surface. It essentially acted as a buffer, and the near surface buffer was hematite magnetite. Log FO2 is minus 72, much, much lower than it is today. So, if you're at minus 72, that means some minerals can form. For example, the iron carbonate siderite. In fact, in order to form the iron carbon siderite at Earth's surface, you need to be less than minus 68 in log FO2. So that's, we know it formed. There are siderite and anchorite deposits in that period. But many minerals couldn't form. So for example, the copper carbonates, azurite and malachite. If you look at that phase diagram, in order to form azurite and malachite, you have to have a log FO2 greater than minus 43. That's th almost 30 log units higher. And certainly there worked processes of photooxidation. There were various kinds of reaction paths that could take you into more oxidizing domains. But we've yet to find any path that will take us 30 log units into the azurite and malachite field. Hence, most copper minerals simply would not have formed before the great oxidation event. And that goes for uranium minerals and manganese minerals and nickel minerals. It goes for iron minerals and cobalt minerals and molybdenum minerals. And you go down the list and something like 3,000 of the known mineral species simply cannot form before you have these much more oxidizing conditions at the surface. So we have these changes in atmospheric conditions that is the number one mineral diversifier on Earth. It's very likely that other planets and moons in our solar system will not show this mineral diversity. And we think this is very important for monitoring other planets um, and sort of describing how far they got in mineral evolution. Here we've reached more than 200 carbonate minerals, including about 150 hydrous carbonates for the first time. And then we come to the last stage, stage 10. This is Phanerozoic biomineralization, where we have a terrestrial biosphere, where we have the formation of biominerals. And here we see new morphologies of carbonate-bearing minerals and a new distribution across Earth's surface. Very, very important. And there are about 50 new biominerals uh, that are... That are organic species, some of which form in cave deposits in guano, some of which form and are found in coal measures. So this is a diversification that's directly related to life. 
There's some fascinating details, which I'd love to go into, but, but just to remind you, as oceans magnesium to calcium ratio change, we see shifts in those carbonate biomineralization from aragonite to calcite, to aragonite to calcite, and back now to aragonite again, based on the MgCa ratio. And this ratio plays another amazing role in biomineralization. Uh, Rick mentioned trilobites. I love trilobites. I collect trilobites. Trilobite eyes, each of those individual facets is a single crystal of calcite with the C-axis pointing out at you. But calcite is a lousy material for a lens because it has chromatic aberration. The red and blue light focus differently. So the trilobite eye is zoned from the center to the outside in calcium magnesium to correct for chromatic aberration. It's an amazing example of nanotechnology that, that is part of evolution. So conclusions about carbon mineral evolution, carbon's played a central role in cosmic mineralogy since those very first Ur minerals. The great oxidation event was the most important factor in the carbon mineral diversification, and the biosphere has played a key role in the changing chemistry of the exosphere. Okay, so now let's talk about another aspect which, in which, interestingly, carbon and minerals also have very strong interactions, and that's the origin of life, molecular carbon evolution. And here again, many, many collaborators, I can't name them all, I want to compliment, especially George Cody, who's taking the lead in the efforts of the Carnegie Institution, Dmitry Svrjenski at Johns Hopkins, and Harold Morowitz, who is sort of our guru at George Mason University, a theoretical biologist who has many profound ideas about origins of life. We have three basic assumptions, very simple ones. The first life forms were carbon-based. There's no exotic chemistry here. Rocks, oceans, atmosphere, that's what you have as your raw materials. And that the origin of life is a sequence of emergent steps, going from geochemical simplicity to biochemical complexity. And you can study the origin of life, therefore, as the sequence of events. A key principle of our thinking is that the origin of life is geochemistry. It is not biochemistry. It's, by definition, before that. So you have to think about geochemical complexities. And the origin of life, indeed, is a complex evolving system. So gradients and temperature and composition, cycles day, night, hot, cold, wet, dry. Fluxes, as you might find in all sorts of Earth-type environments. Interfaces, solid liquid interfaces, of course, but also liquid air interfaces, Vesicles may be high in the atmosphere in the form of aerosols. All different kinds of interfaces play a key role. And chemical complexity itself. Earth is a very complex chemical system with, with 50 or 60 major, minor, and trace elements in almost any geochemical environment you can name. And so you have to think about the role of not just simple two and three component systems like carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. Well, the first step in life's origin had to be the emergence of the basic building blocks, the lipids, the amino acids, the sugars, the building blocks of DNA and RNA. And so we need to make carbon-carbon bonds. And so the idea of many origin of life experiments is just taking simple atmospheric gases, volcanic gases, and making carbon-carbon bonds, two, three, four carbon molecules. This is well-established chemistry. Miller Urey did it more than 60 years ago. And thousands of subsequent experiments of this type shown facile production of organic molecules when you have various kinds of atmospheres, especially if hydrogen is present. That's a real key. And any kind of electric spark or ultraviolet radiation, you'll produce organic molecules. You can also do this in simulated environments of dense molecular clouds. For example, it's done by Lou Alamandola at NASA Ames, also some very important work done in Europe in which you can produce a whole suite of organic molecules through these very simple sets of conditions, ultraviolet radiation in a high vacuum, very cold temperatures, but you produce new molecules. And we're studying the hydrothermal hypothesis where a higher temperature, higher pressure volcanic regime may have played a role in origin of life. From our earliest work, published in the 1990s, we saw minerals acting as catalysts. For example, the work of Jay Brandis, where you can start with dinitrogen gas, and any one of a whole number of transition metal oxides or sulfides see the reaction to produce ammonia. We also are interested in forming carbon-carbon bonds, and there are two main ways that this can be done in our chemistry. fischer trope type reactions, where you just basically build longer and longer carbon molecules, expansion of alkanes. In some of our early experiments, just using CO2, 
hydrogen and water with iron metal as a catalyst or using iron sulfide or iron oxides, you see an explosion of molecules. In a 24-hour experiment, we typically see CO2 converting into C30 and C40 molecules, alkanes, but also some very interesting other structures of branching molecules, alcohols and so forth, coming out of these experiments. There's an alternative chemistry we can explore. That's called hydroformylation, where you insert CO groups, starting with CO2 or carbon monoxide. And we see, again, building longer and longer molecules, leading to fundamental molecules that are part of the reductive TCA cycle. And the exciting thing about this is that when you use different minerals, you get different combinations of these reactions. So looking at a little piece of the periodic table here, you see that iron and copper sulfides are particularly effective at Fischer-Tropsch synthesis. But cobalt and nickel is particularly effective at hydroformylation. And you can imagine a hot smoke or a vent environment where you have all these different nanoparticles of different minerals circulating with molecules sticking to them, undergoing reactions. And if you add nitrogen and sulfur to the mix, you can have a, just an incredible diversity of organic molecules forming. And indeed, that's step two. That's the problem. We solved the, the Synthesis of biomolecules is easy. It's, it's too easy. You make too much different stuff. It's indiscriminate. But life, a fundamental attribute is that it's highly idiosyncratic. It's selective. It concentrates only a few molecules and use them. So how do you select and concentrate the right molecules? That's a fundamental problem in origin of life science. And we think that there are a couple different ways. One of them we know is self-organization. One of our early experiments took pyruvate, three carbon molecule, with CO2, put it at high pressure and high temperature, and we were hoping we'd make the four carbon molecule oxaloacetate, because that's one of the key steps in a reductive citric acid cycle. But that didn't happen. Instead, we made a yellow-brown oily goo. It was messy. It was smelly. It smelled like Jack Daniels, actually. It was pretty, pretty interesting. But, it, 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 but when you do the GC of this, you, you basically see there are thousands of molecules being produced. And that's actually rather discouraging for origin of life research because if you make thousands of molecules, you know, you're not really discriminating, you're not selecting the right ones. How could this be of use? But if you take a drop of that yellow-brown oily goo and you put it in water, it self-organizes. It organizes into a bilayer membrane and you form these beautiful fluorescent pockets. And this clearly, this is something that's been found with extracts from Murchison meteorite. It's been found from the kinds of experiments done um, in, in Miller-Urey experiments. So this is really a very facile way of making of structures that have what look like biological insignificance, perhaps. So this is one way of organizing and selecting molecules, self-organization. But Many of the molecules we synthesize are water-soluble. They're not going to self-organize in water. Amino acids and sugars simply just are in solution. And so we have a problem. And we have even a bigger problem because in life, the amino acids we use are mostly left-handed. The sugars, mostly right-handed. They come in mirror image pairs, and when you synthesize them in any prebiotic reaction, you make a 50-50 mixture. So somehow you have to have local regions that are selected and concentrated. How do you do that? And it turns out that this is work we're doing that has some potential commercial importance because we all buy pharmaceuticals that have to be chirally pure, and the purification of chiral pharmaceuticals is big business, $200 billion a year. So we look at the idea of mineral surfaces as possibly being places where chiral molecules could stick. And virtually every common rock-forming mineral has chiral surfaces in one way or another the crystal growth faces of feldspar. In pyroxenes, like diopside, both crystal growth faces and the common cleavage surfaces of pyroxenes and amphiboles are chiral faces. And my favorite, calcite, the commonest growth face again, chiral surfaces. And so one can imagine left and right-handed molecules sticking on different faces. We've demonstrated this in this very experiments, and we can understand in detail why this happens. This is density functional theory work by Erevin Ash, the Gary, and myself looking at why right-handed amino acid aspartate sticks to the calcite 2, 1 surface much better than left-handed. Why should that be? Well, it turns out when you do the calculations, when you have left-handed aspartic, there are only two points of interaction, and the surface becomes quite distorted. So that's energetically unfavorable. If you have the right-handed aspartic called D-asp in, in the archaic nomenclature of, uh, of chirality, you have three points of interaction, and the surface is not very distorted. So you have this 
it's like a bowling ball. You have a right-handed bowling ball, a left-handed bowling ball for people who've ever done American bowling. You can only use the handedness of the ball or fit putting your right hand in a left-handed glove. It doesn't work. It's the same sort of thing. The right-handed molecule fits, the left-handed molecule doesn't, and there's an eight kilocalorie per mole difference in energy of these two configurations. So there's a huge chiral selectivity on the mineral surface. Well, we also do very detailed studies of other conditions, geochemically relevant conditions, and how they affect adsorption. And it turns out you really have to keep this in mind when you're doing this kind of experiment. So for example, looking at glutamate absorbing on TiO2, rutile, which is one of our sort of, uh, it's, it's a standard oxide surface that has very stable configuration in an aqueous environment, and therefore we can study it in some rigorous detail. You see very strong pH dependent. You see very strong dependence on the strength of the solution of your absorbents, and also very strong ionic strength dependence. And taking these various data together and combining them, you can come up with detailed models of how the molecules are absorbing to the surface. In the case of glutamate on rutile, we see two different bonding configurations, and that's a very common state of affairs. So we have a standing up configuration, and also one where you have a lying down configuration. It's only in the lying down case, by the way, that you could have chiral selection, because that's the only one where you'd have three points of interaction. And we see a very strong pH dependent, and also a very strong uh, solution concentration dependence. At very high concentration of glutamate, there's crowding on the surface, so all the molecules want to stand up. At low concentrations, it's easier for them to lie down. And then when you start combining molecules in a single experiment, you start seeing really interesting effects. So for example, there are four pentose sugars, arabinose, lyxose, xylose, and ribose. Now we know that life has selected ribose for RNA. Why not the other three? Well, let's see how they interact with minerals. So here's a study done by Katya Klotchko looking at those four different molecules absorbing onto uh, simultaneously competing for sites on rutile. We find that xylose and arabinose don't absorb very strongly at all. Lyxose is somewhat better, but here we see in an alkaline environment, ribose beats them all. And indeed, so far, all the experiments that people have done in this kind show that ribose seems to be more strongly absorbing than the other pentose sugars. And here's another amazing discovery. This is Nami Lee and her thesis work, uh, yet to be published, but except it's in the thesis. And she describes how when you look at lysine absorbing onto rutile, you don't get much absorption except at, at a modest absorption at high pH. And previous work of Johnson all, where you look at glutamate, you get high absorption at lower pH. At neutral pH, you see very little absorption of either molecule unless you put lysine and glutamate in the same experiment. And then you see significantly higher absorption of both of them. There's a cooperative effect where lysine and glutamate are cooperating in their absorption. And clearly, this had to be part of origin of life. Origin of life has to be a case where you have mineral surfaces, complex prebiotic soup, different molecules interacting and building up structures on the surface, which then ultimately, one hopes, can lead to step three, which is the emergence of self-replicating molecular systems. Reproduction. There are three main kinds of ideas in play. One is the idea that first self-replicating system was a reductive TCA cycle, you may know it as the citric acid cycle, or the Krebs cycle, run in what is the reverse of the normal way, but that's a deeply rooted biochemical fossil in all our cells. There's also the RNA world model, the idea that an RNA molecule that could make copies of itself was a possible first form of life. And there's other ideas about autocatalytic networks where the chemistry is very fuzzy, but it's an interesting conceptual idea. Well, we've been focusing on the first, and George Cody, in fact, has taken various minerals, trying to simulate the kinds of enzymes that are used by the TCA cycle today. All those enzymes have at their core a tiny cluster of atoms that look for all the world like a transition metal sulfide, iron or nickel sulfide, and he's been able to reproduce many steps in that TCA cycle just using minerals as catalysts. So, my conclusion is in the origin of life is that minerals played key roles in life's origins through catalysis, through selection, concentration of key biomolecules, maybe templating and organization of those molecules. And minerals may have acted as primitive enzymes in those first self-replicating cycles. So when we think about carbon molecular evolution, mineral evolution also plays a role. Okay, 
I want to end by talking about the potential of Earth materials data to transform our science, particularly transform for me understanding Earth's deep time history. Because when we look at deep time, we need lots of data on lots of different materials and how those materials have changed through time. Again, lots of collaborators on this, and especially I want to point out some of the heroes of this game, and this is just a few of the people who I've worked with. There are many, many more who have been creating data infrastructure, data resources for the entire community to use. This is fundamentally important for my work, and I think that we're going to see uh, more and more attention devoted to this. For me, I, I work with mineralogy databases, and three of the ones that have been important to me, um, the Rough database, which is basically the International Mineralogical Association list of all the official minerals. We have mindat.org, which is a huge database, not only of all the mineral species, but thousands, hundreds of thousands of localities and mineral associations. It's run by mineral collectors, so it's a very dedicated group. Uh, one has to vet it very carefully because it's not always entirely um, accurate information, but it's extremely useful information. Nowhere else can one find this. And then, of course, there's lots of rock chemical data. What I don't have at present is data resources that take huge numbers of mineral specimens and have the age information and all the geochemical data, the trace, the minor elements. I would love to have databases that had 10,000 tourmaline analyses that gave me boron isotopes, that gave me all the trace and minor elements, gave me localities that gave me ages, or for amphiboles, or for pyroxenes, or carbonates. This simply doesn't exist. And so what we have to do in my field is what is called brute force use cases. That's the term of art in the data science world. So numerous correlations reveal aspects of Earth history. They're hidden in data that exists already that's published in various sorts. I want to just briefly talk about three of these, molybdenite, beryllium boron minerals, and mercury minerals, and you'll see what I mean. OK, so we had an intuition that if you looked at the rhenium content of the common molybdenum sulfide molybdenite, that rhenium content would somehow reflect subsurface redox conditions because rhenium is a redox-sensitive element that's mobilized only in its seven-valent state and therefore only incorporated in molybdenite when you have redox conditions that permit that. And so Joshua Golden and Melissa McMillan at University of Arizona spent about a year and a half pouring through literature, found 500 references in about 20 different languages that had molybdenite analyses, told you how much rhenium was present, and told you the age of those samples. We correlated that with their ages, having to find them in many other publications. And there is, even though the data is still sparse and we'd like to have a lot more data, there seems to be a genuine statistically significant increase in rhenium content through time. And what we found particularly interesting was that the great oxidation event is there, but we don't see a jump in our data until maybe 500 to a billion years later. And the Snowball Earth's second great oxidation event is here. And again, there seems to be a big lag time before you see a significant change in rhenium. We don't have enough statistics yet, but this is the best we could do. And this took a year and a half of, of human uh, labor to do this one graph. That's brute force. Here's another one, Ed Grew, just a heroic study of all the beryllium minerals. There are 106 of them, and how you see this through the first appearance of beryllium minerals through time, and you see that it's very episodic. It's not smooth or continuous what's going on in these episodes. And then even more heroic, it's amazing, there's over 200 boron minerals, and Ed has been studying every one of them. And a typical email from Ed will look like this. Not that you should read the whole thing, but he's asking us to try to track down four obscure references. Two of them are in Bolivian. Uh, or from Bolivia, not, not, uh, Bolivian is not actually a language, is it? But uh, one's, one's in Serbian, and, and one's an obscure Kazakhstan field report. And, uh, but that's the primary data on the ages of certain minerals of boron. And so you do this. Now, there's good reasons to do this. We can study very important sweeping changes in Earth history. For example, the supercontinent cycle. And you may recall that there have been five episodes in Earth history where it looks like most of the continents have come together, that particularly during periods of assembly of Kennerland, of Columbia, Rodinia, Panodia, Pangea, you see 
pulses of mineralization. This is well known. It's known from the zircon data. Now, you say, well, what does this have to do with carbon? Haven't I gotten really off topic? Well, no, everything is related, first of all, in earth sciences. You've got to remember that. And the second thing is that for supercontinents, I mean, this affects ocean levels. That affects the formation of carbonate platforms. It affects coastal nutrients and, therefore, the blooming of, of algae and production of oxygen and so forth. It affects climate because of ocean atmosphere chemistry changes, continental weathering. That, of course, affects the carbonate cycle tremendously, and it affects plate tectonics too. I mean, this, the whole idea of subduction and patterns of volcanism, all this relates to the carbon cycle. So you can't, I mean, understanding the supercontinent cycle is an important part of understanding carbon. And of course, we know that there are pulses of mineralization that occur with the assembly of supercontinents. It's well established in the zircon record. And so we expect to see this. So in our study of molybdenites, you see, although the statistics aren't nearly as good because there's only about 150 uh, or, or so localities in which we have dated molybdenites. Nevertheless, you see pulses for Kennerland and Columbia and Rodinia, and maybe even Panodia, but certainly Pangaea. If you look at beryllium and boron minerals, again, you see pulses of mineralization which correlate with the supercontinent cycle. And then there's mercury. And what a puzzle this is, because even though the data are sparse, we see mercury mineralization associated with Kennerland, with Columbia, certainly Pangaea, maybe even a little pulse there from Odia, but there is nothing for 1.2 billion years during the assembly and stability of Rodinia. Absolutely nothing in the record, not a single known mercury mineral locality. And why is that? We're still puzzled. We have some hypotheses. I'd love to get ideas from people. But that's an unexpected finding from this kind of data. And here's another one associated with mercury. The terrestrial biosphere changed the game for Earth's mineral evolution. And here's one of the reasons. We know that there was a period of intense burial of organic carbon from about 200 to 400 million years ago. Those are the coal measures that are deposited and so forth. But who knew that it had a profound effect on the mercury cycle? Well, if you look at Earth's diversification of mercury minerals, the greatest diversification occurred during that exact same interval. All the world's largest mercury ore deposits are from this interval and it appears to be associated with the deposition of organic carbon, which you can understand because mercury bonds to organic carbon, but not very tightly. So if hydrothermal fluids come along, it will then dissolve, concentrate the mercury, which then can produce an ore field. So here we see intimate connections between the carbon cycle in deep time and other minerals as well. What I've described to you so far is very routine, ordinary science, even if it is brute force. Most of what we do is we collect data to understand phenomena that we already recognize. And so we know there was a period of atmospheric oxidation, and so you look for rhenium and molybdenite because you have a hunch that maybe you're going to see a pattern. Or you know there was a supercontinent cycle, so you look at the mineralization of, of mercury or some other elements because you expect to see a pattern. And maybe you'll find something interesting and maybe you won't. But I would like to suggest that there's a much more profound use of data resources. And that's something that's not inductive or deductive discovery, it's abductive discovery. It's a different way of doing science. It's foreign to most of us. Say, let's collect vast amounts of data and let the data take us where the correlations are. We're not going to make a prediction. We're just going to, let, we're going to start with these vast data resources. And if you can do multivariate analysis, you can do principal component analysis on a system where basically you may have 50 compositional variables. Imagine those tourmalines, 10,000 tourmaline analysis, each with 50 or so different trace and minor elements. And you don't know what the correlations are, but you look at those versus time. And you create new variables. They're found by computer through principal component analysis, which essentially linear combinations of all those compositional variables or isotope ratios or tectonic setting or who knows what variable you want to use. You put them all together. You search for those highly correlated patterns, things that you would never think of looking for and things that are dimensionally beyond anything that human mind can, can put up. But the computer can do it for you. And what you do is you can then take those and you can also implement new visualization strategies. Imagine taking correlations of element ratios using clay diagrams of this sort. It's used in biology all the time, but we don't seem to use it much in geochemistry. Coexisting minerals. So you might have 200 different nickel, cobalt, arsenic, sulfur minerals, and you look at the correlations. What coexists with what? What element ratios? What isotope ratios? 
do we see? And they just pop out at you because you see hot spots on a diagram like this. Or using skyline diagrams where the horizontal axis is time, but you nest dozens of different parameters. And you start seeing trends, detailed trends, perhaps associated with the supercontinent cycle, but some elements may form early, some may form late. You may see other outliers that tell you new information, things that we've never thought to ask because they're buried in data that already exists. And that's the killer. This data is out there. It's in hundreds of thousands of publications. It's in dark data. It's in people's file drawers. It's just waiting for discovery. They represent a path to discovering what we don't know we don't know. And to me, that's the most exciting thing you can do in science. So my conclusion is the published and dark data on Earth materials contain important insights related to the coevolution of the geosphere and the biosphere related to Earth history. If we could only achieve this integrated Earth materials data infrastructure, it could represent a new kind of open access scientific instrument, an engine of discovery in geochemistry. My conclusions for the talk, near surface carbon mineralogy has changed and changed dramatically through Earth history. Earth's geosphere and biosphere have co-evolved in many different ways and the Earth materials data infrastructure could be, will be, I hope, an engine of discovery. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Hope there's some questions. We're going to have time for questions. That's great. No questions. Should we expect that if uh, life evolves on another planet, it would have the same priority as it does on this the question was, should we expect life to have the same chirality as it does on this planet? And this is a matter of intense philosophical discussion amongst origin of life researchers. There are some people that say that this is a deterministic aspect, that left-handed amino acids are somehow hardwired into the cosmos. And they cite the fact that some meteorites seem to have an excess of L amino acids. Others, however, say that it's a stochastic process, that you may have a local environment where there's more L and that self-replicating cycle is the one that won and maybe another place where you have a concentration of R and that's the self-replicating cycle that won and so it could be a 50-50 thing and we just simply don't know but it's a great question and lots of people are thinking about it. Any other questions? If not, we'll thank Bob again and return to the other session.